So I'd like to talk here about uh, black body radiation, and in particular, the derivation of the Raleigh genes and Planck distributions. So black body radiation is the idea of a perfect absorber and emitter of light. It, it's basically, a, you want to think of it as a, a, a cavity or a box with a hole in it, and light will go into that, and then once it's inside, it'll bounce around and, and never escape. So whatever light comes to the object, it is perfectly absorbed. And at the same time, you have perfect emission as well. And what is known is that the emission depends on the temperature of the box. So you've got some you know, little, uh, little fire here under the box, and you get a, a temperature that's being emitted. And this is uh, represented by the uh, total emissive power R, which is a function of temperature. And back in, uh, I guess it was uh, 1879, uh, uh, it was first proposed by, uh, I don't know what his first name is, it's uh, Stefan and uh, Boltzmann. And it took between 1879 and uh, 18, sorry, 84 for the Stefan Boltzmann law to be formulated. Which said that the total emissive power goes as the temperature to the fourth. And this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is uh, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watt per meter squared Kelvin. So this totally missive power has units of watt per meter squared. Now, if we are uh, talking about the total emissive power, we can break that down on a per wavelength level and recognize that the total emissive power is the integral from zero to infinity of the spectral power integrated over the entire spectrum. This is the spectral emittance. And this spectral emittance, uh, this is equivalent to rho lambda t, the energy distribution, as a function of the, uh, the temperature and the wavelength. And I bring up this energy distribution, because, oh, I bring up this energy distribution because we know that this energy distribution is uh, characterized by Wien's law, which is, this was uh, 18, 93, which said that the energy distribution has to go as the wavelength raised to the fifth. So this is some function of wavelength and uh, temperature 
but, but fundamentally it goes as the wavelength to the fifth. And uh, the energy distribution has been measured to have a shape something like this. With increasing temperature, the maximum of this curve shifts to the left. And this was measured, ah, man, this was measured in uh, 1899 by Lumar and Pringstein. Pringstein, S-H-E-I-N. And from that, we have the V and displacement law. Which tells us that the maximum value, the uh, apex of your distribution times the temperature is equal to a constant, which is 2.9 times 10 to the minus three meter Kelvin. And this was in uh, 1893. So it was kind of time for a, uh, well, a generalized theory of black body radiation to come about. And this brings us to our A Y rally in genes. So genes is James Jeans, who later on uh, gets known for uh, studying the uh, critical radius of interstellar gases uh, in the formation of clouds, or sorry, in the, in the formation of stars. And Raleigh, which is Lord Raleigh, which his name was not Lord, but he was John William Strut, the third Baron Raleigh. Uh, who went on to get a Nobel Prize for uh, the measurement of gas densities and uh, the discovery of argon. But nonetheless, uh, these two uh, came together and uh, worked on black body radiation. And the idea that they had was that you have this cavity and you know the cavity is a cavity, but it can also be thought of as a uh, uh, collection of standing 
uh, dielectric oscillators in a material. Uh, but the idea is that light comes in, and when it comes in, it gets trapped inside this box. And as a result, you have all these different modes that are reflecting in the box. So we can treat this box as a collection of vibrating oscillators. Uh, regardless, you wind up with some wave expression. So the, the waves in a cubic cavity, I'm sorry, switch pages here. You know what? I will put it here, I guess. And cubic cavity is a uh, size uh, L. So got some boundaries on that. They obey a wave equation. D, D, T. No, well, that's my mistake. This actually, uh, there should be a square here. So it's a second derivative with respect to time. <clears throat> okay, so you're solving this. You have to have the, the boundaries. Uh, Uh, the field equal to zero. Now these are whoop, assumed to be some type of metallic box, and the uh, the light is perfectly reflected inside. And we don't have electric fields inside metals, so uh, we set that to zero, and that yields a solution. So we have some amplitude. And I'm having it be a cubic box, so all the sides of the box are L. And then a uh, sorry, time dependent part here sine 2 pi ct over. Lambda. Okay. And then in order to meet those boundary conditions, you wind up with So we now have a solution within this so-called N space, right? So we have, uh, if you want to imagine it, as some NZ and sorry, and X and Y. series of points and each point uh, 
a solution to the wave equation. So if we want to take and, and start talking about the number of solutions per energy or number of solutions per volume, what we can do is we can talk about the number of points within a given volume of space. And we're going to do that is we're going to have some sphere, or actually in particular, because our solutions are uh, you know, larger than zero, we're going to be talking about uh, solutions in this uh, octet or quadrant of the uh, n space. So if we have some sphere of radius r, and we say that the outer whoop, the outermost point that that r touches is going to be some n and call that uh, you know n one n two n three then the radius has size n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared, right? That's going to be, uh, you know, we have some vector representation of the maximum n. So then the volume of the sphere to four thirds pi r cubed, which is four thirds pi n one squared plus n two squared plus n three squared to the three halves. So we have a half from the uh, the radical sign and we get three from the, the three. Now, this is the volume of a sphere. And we have to multiply that by uh, two because there's two polarizations that you can have. So in, in a given uh, in a given solution here, you could have something that does this, or you could have something that does this, right? So you actually have twice as many solutions. And then because this is a whole sphere and we're only interested in this octant or quadrant, we have to take that by one over eight. Which means N is two over eight, four, three, pi, n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared to the three halves. And we have our uh, solution here at 4L squared lambda squared, which we're going to dump in there. And with substitution, we get n is equal to pi over 3, 8 L cubed over lambda cubed. So this n is the number of modes 
or number of wave solutions inside uh, inside a sphere size lambda r equals square root of n1 plus n2 plus n3 knowing i'm sorry squared 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 knowing that this selection of n comes from n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared equals four L squared over lambda squared. So got N and that. So for a given lambda, we now have the number of modes that can exist. Now, we want to take this number of modes and we want to say, per wavelength, well, that's going to be dn by dl, which is going to give us 8 pi L cubed over lambda to the 4. So that is modes per volume per wavelength Oh, sorry, it just molds per wavelength. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, and then if we want to take that and find modes per wavelength per volume, we're going to have to take 8 pi L cubed over lambda 4 times 1 over L cubed, which is going to give us 8 pi over lambda to the four modes per length per volume. Okay, so what are we going to do with that? Well, We've got that, and if we want to use this to get the energy distribution, we've got rho lambda t, 8 pi over lambda the fourth. We need to get a temperature dependence in that. And we also want to know the energy of, of these modes. And for that, we'll use this E bar, which is the Uh, average energy at a given T. You know, you can think of that as the uh, 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 average being taken over this distribution, but the development at the time that was able to facilitate this was the, the Boltzmann energy distribution. So let me, before I move on, I'm gonna highlight this because so far this, the uh, derivation for the uh, 
Boltzmann and the side of the Boltzmann, sorry, the uh, uh, Rowley gene and the Planck distributions have run parallel. And this is the place where they start to diverge is, is how they determine the energy. So a recent development that facilitates looking at the average uh, energy of an ensemble at a given temperature was the, the Boltzmann energy distribution. So let's take a brief aside here to, to discuss that. This comes about from our statistical mechanical understanding that for a given uh, energy, call it energy sub R, uh, the probability of finding the system in that state goes as X of negative beta E sub R over Z beta. So ER, that is the uh, energy of that Rth state. And this ZB or Z beta is the uh, partition function. And that is equal to the sum from, uh, let's call this I equals uh, zero to infinity x negative beta ei or if we can turn it from a sum into an integral which we love to do because it makes the math a lot easier that gives us the integral x minus beta er d e sorry not er because I'm trying to stay away from that. I'm gonna leave this, uh, call this, uh, oh, let me rewrite this, this is running out of space. This is integral uh, X EI beta, negative, Beta EI D EI. I mean, EI is the dummy variable. But you get it. We're taking and we are looking at all the uh, solutions there. And this uh, beta is equal to one over Boltzmann constant times the temperature. So if we have this probability, then the expectation value for that probability is the integral ER PR D ER. And then we can put in this particular value for ER into that the integral in for Z. And you wind up with the integral ER X negative beta ER over Z beta. And in this case, whoops, whoops, whoops. In this case, we wind up with it's 
equal to integral from zero to infinity of e e x p negative beta e d e divided by integral e x p negative beta e d e. And this is where the Raleigh genes comes from. The Raleigh genes expression, right? Using this, and then in place of the average energy, the expectation for the Boltzmann distribution using a continuous distribution of wavelengths. And we're going to solve this. using that the integral from zero to infinity x of x dx is equal to one. Wait, I'm sorry about that. There's a negative sign in here. Sorry, x of negative x dx from zero to infinity goes to one. Okay. Yeah, I have not had enough coffee today. Uh, so the integral from zero to infinity e x of negative beta e de using the substitution u beta equals beta e is this one over beta du equals de and as e goes to zero u goes to zero as e goes to infinity u goes to infinity that means we're integrating one over beta u x of negative u one over beta du. Right, we had our substitution here and uh, here, oh, and of course there. Now we get one over beta squared integral from zero to infinity u x minus u du and we integrate this using integration by parts so the integral of f of x g prime of x is equal of dx is equal to f of x g of x minus the integral of f prime of x g of x dx where u is equal to f so f prime is equal to one and x of minus u is equal to g prime. So g is equal to minus x of minus u. And that allows us to uh, 
using this analogy, have u times minus x minus u from u equals zero to infinity minus integral zero to infinity x of minus u du this in the limit that u goes to infinity of minus u over x of u minus in the limit uh, u goes to zero of minus u over x u of that goes to zero this goes to zero this side though gives me uh, infinity over infinity which means I have to apply the L'Hopital rule. Whoop. The L hospital rule as uh, I've heard it called uh, the limit of G over F is equal to limit of G prime over F prime which means that now this can also be written limit as u goes to infinity of minus one over x u, which is then zero because that goes to infinity. Okay. So that is going to uh, handle those parts. Uh, which means that our integral that Integral from zero to infinity x negative beta e is equal to one over beta squared zero minus zero minus negative one is equal to plus one over beta squared. Okay, so that's just the numerator. Now let's take the denominator. And the denominator gives us uh, integral of zero to infinity, exponential of minus beta e dE e, using u is equal to beta e. We get the integral from zero to infinity x of minus u one over beta du or one over beta, right? Because we know x one uh, x to the minus x dx is one, which means that the expectation value of the energy is one over beta squared over one over beta is equal to one over beta is equal to K Boltzmann T. And when we take and we substitute that back in, we get lambda T is equal to eight pi over lambda to the four KT, which means lambda to the Sorry, uh, 
rho to the lambda t and then I do this. It blows up. Okay, and that's no good because we know what it should look like is something like this. And this was referred to as the ultraviolet catastrophe. So the rally genes does work, by the way, for uh, large values of lambda. But small values of lambda, we have the ultraviolet catastrophe. And, uh, well, yeah, that's just no good. So this leaves open room for correction, of course. And that's where Planck comes from. And Planck, uh, his idea was that energy would be quantized. And this was something that he was, well, it shows up often in the history of science, uh, Planck quantization here. So, wants to replace E, which ranges from zero to E to infinity with some quantization. Now, you still have zero, uh, sorry, N times epsilon naught being bracketed, but Instead of taking a continuous range of values now, we have one epsilon naught, two epsilon naught, three epsilon naught, da, 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 and epsilon naught. So you only take discretized values of energy, which look a lot like quantum states. And uh, that's what they became. So let's go back. And uh, I said that the derivations agreed through this point. And they even agree uh, talking about using the uh, Boltzmann energy distribution. However, rather than have a uh, continuous integrand, we now are dealing with a summation. which means that now our E bar T is equal to the expectation of E is equal to the sum N is equal to zero to infinity and E naught X of negative beta N E naught over the integral X of minus beta N E naught. So you can see that this and uh, this, they look very similar, except we now have a summation. And I should write in the summation N equals zero to infinity. So now we got to solve it. And what you'll see here is, is that uh, we really dislike sums because when you have sums, then you now have to deal with series. Uh, so let's, let's uh, look at the solution sum. So we're going to start with, well, I find it very unsatisfying, but nonetheless, it, it's the right way to do things uh, by looking at what we know is a recognized solution. Uh, in particular, if you take the negative derivative with respect to beta of the log of the sum 
of exponent negative beta n epsilon naught, then just breaking down and integrating, you know, the log, then the exponent, then the interior of the exponent, you get one over the sum. So we do the log first, n equals zero to infinity exp negative beta n epsilon naught. Then what's inside the log, we get uh, the sum n epsilon naught exp negative beta n epsilon naught. So we took the interior out and then we took the, the derivative of the interior. Okay. So what this means, it means that this entire expression can be rewritten as negative d by d beta log of the sum n equals zero to infinity x of negative beta n epsilon naught. Okay, good first step. But now how do we deal with that summation? Well, this is similar to a geometric series. It's not exactly a geometric series because a geometric series, uh, well, the geometric series uh, you'll see has, uh, it has, uh, some a r to the k, but r is less than one. So this isn't exactly the geometric series, but we can show convergence using a very similar technique. So if you go through the, the, the derivation of the geometric series, you'll find, of course, substituting r value, some one over k is equal to one to n e to the minus alpha k is equal to e, e to the zero plus e to the minus alpha plus e to the minus two alpha plus e to the minus three alpha plus dot 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 plus e to the n, or sorry, minus n alpha. Okay, now we can take and now multiply that series by one minus e to the minus alpha sum k equals one to n e to the minus alpha k. So we've got this. And if we do that, we get one, or whatever, e to the zero, minus e to the minus alpha, right? Because e to the zero is one times that product plus e to the minus alpha minus e to the minus alpha e to the minus alpha plus e to the minus two alpha minus e to the minus e to the minus alpha e to the minus two alpha plus dot 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 plus e to the minus alpha n minus e to the minus alpha e to the minus alpha n. 
great. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect, collect the positive and negative terms of this series. And if we do that, we get uh, equals, one plus e to the minus alpha plus e to the minus two alpha plus e to the minus three alpha plus dot 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 plus e to the minus n alpha. Those are all the, the positive terms in this expression. Bump, 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 bump. And then minus e to the minus alpha, minus e to the minus two alpha, minus e to the minus three alpha, minus dot, 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 minus e to the minus n alpha, minus e to the minus n plus one alpha, right? That's uh, there. Which means that we have cancellation because those cancel, those, those, those. And we wind up with, substitute that back down in, uh, one minus e to the minus alpha sum k equals one to n e to the minus alpha k is equal to one minus e to the alpha n plus one. Whoops. Which means the sum k equals one to n e to the minus alpha k is equal to one minus e to the negative alpha n plus one over one minus e to e to the minus alpha. And if I take this and take the limit as n goes to infinity, well, this goes away and we get one over one minus e to the minus alpha which means our expression here, which looks a lot like, or I should say here, which looks a lot like that becomes this in the limit that n goes to infinity. So the punchline here is the sum n equals zero to infinity, x of minus beta n epsilon naught is equal to one over one minus e to the minus beta epsilon naught, which means that the expectation value is minus one over, sorry, d by d beta, natural log of one over one minus x negative beta epsilon naught which then when we you know distribute the differential turns into minus one over one minus x negative beta epsilon naught to the minus one times minus one over one minus x minus beta epsilon naught squared plus epsilon naught x negative 
beta epsilon naught. And we're gonna have you know this and that cancel, uh, the negative signs cancel. And then collecting these terms together, we get uh, is equal to epsilon naught x minus beta epsilon naught over one minus oof, one minus exp negative beta epsilon naught and multiply the top and bottom by x of plus beta epsilon naught over exp plus epsilon naught. We wind up with the expectation value equal to epsilon naught over exp beta epsilon naught minus one. And that is our E bar T, which means that now our rho lambda T is equal to eight pi over lambda to the four E naught over E X of beta epsilon naught minus one. Okay. And one last step is making an observation here about Wien's law. That rho must go as one over lambda to the fifth. Well, that implies then that epsilon naught is gonna go as the frequency. H omega, because we then are going to be able to write H C over lambda. And that's going to give us, instead of a lambda to the fourth, it's going to give us a lambda to the five. And we get rho lambda T is equal to eight pi h c over lambda to the five one over e x p h c over lambda k t minus one. And that is the Planck distribution for black body radiation. It is consistent. Well, it matches measurement, which is a really great thing, right? That's kind of the kind of the uh, uh, you know, gold star it's getting is that it, it does have this proper behavior, but it also uh, is consistent with the Stefan Boltzmann law and consistent with uh, the Wien displacement law. So this is the Planck distribution. And the really kind of cool thing is, I mean, it was a lot of math, right? It was a lot of math, but you saw we didn't make really any approximations in this, right? We, we started out from the same points Right, we started everything out up here. So, you know, approximating our black body as a cubic metal box was the same in both. Uh, both assumed that the Boltzmann just energy distribution was correct. And then from there, we just, well, we just exactly solved the Boltzmann distribution, right? There's really no approximation in the integral. There's no approximation in our 
series. And we wound up with, uh, well, radically different solutions, right? One solution that, that, that blows up and, and one that doesn't. And I guess the first time I saw this, uh, it was pretty amazing to me that such a small change in the math could lead to such a, a radical different outcome in the behavior. And, you know, the math is something that most textbooks, you'll see this as, you know, like two paragraphs and say, here's this and here's this. And at least as a student, I'd always say, well, you know, they took some approximation. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, how, how different is it? It's like, well, it's very different. It's very different, even though it's just a very small change in the uh, starting assumption. So, uh, Hope you enjoy and uh, well, kind of makes you feel good actually seeing where this stuff comes from. So 